Amen. Our Friday morning co-host before the crew joins us at 835, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here. Lovely day. And New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Johnny. Good morning. Hey, listen, before we start, real quick, I want to give a shout out to the Jefferson County Emergency Services. I was uh, in Shepherdstown yesterday and a, and a lady took a header off the curb and fell pretty hard and bloodied her, her lip. I think she's okay, but it was it was a pretty bloody thing. So I called 911 to get an ambulance and i just want to say the the unsung heroes of any emergency services are the 911 call takers and i have no idea who this young lady was i just want to put a shout out that she was professional and helpful and friendly and concerned you know all of the things that often doesn't happen in a, in a call taker they can often be very harsh and um, you know sort of to the point and it, this, it was it was not it was not a big incident i'm sure it was a big incident for the lady who fell but I just wanted to put it out there that, that they are the unsung heroes. And I think whoever answered the phone, I, I should have, well, they don't give their names. But anyway, just nicely done. Well done. Good job. Were you close when the incident occurred? Yes. Did you did your old EMT instincts kick in? I, not really, not necessary. Just a lot of blood. She couldn't really drive herself home, mm -hmm. right? Because, um, so I think, I don't know if she knocked out a tooth or not, but she was of a certain age and, and she had a, told me she had a complicating condition that's, not appropriate for here but so she needed an ambulance she mm -hmm. needed she needed some she needed medical treatment and uh so that's why i called 911 but it was um I, I just i was very impressed good yeah i i echo what john's saying because they do they deserve a lot of credit but the credit extends beyond the individual you talk to and that's the foresight of the counties jefferson county berkeley county our both the 911 centers have stated the art equipment they're in a position to respond appropriately so it's a it, there's the residents of the eastern panhandle can rest assured they're well equipped to handle emergencies and you get some credit for that admiral when you were the berkeley county no, commission president years ago yeah that's not what i was fishing for i just but doesn't they, matter you caught did. the fish <laughs> okay. well they do uh, i think john's shout, shout out is well reserved we've been talking about vaccinations this week since the house voted i believe it was 57 to 40 i think the vote was 57 41 or 42 to uh, repeal some of the provisions in the vaccination requirements in the state to include the religious exemption option for not just virtual schools, parochial, and also public schools as well. The legislation moves to the Senate. It made it before crossover day, and it's up to the Senate as to whether they'll pick up that bill and consider it or not for passage before this week ends. In the meantime, we've talked with Dr. Kevin McLaughlin from the Berkeley County Health Department. We've also talked with Bill Kearns, the executive director of said health department. And this morning, we welcome in Dr. Catherine S. Moffitt, MD. Good morning, Dr. Moffitt. How are you this morning? Good morning. Good morning. I'm good. Thank you for having me. How are all of you? Great. Thank you. You are the professor of pediatrics uh, at uh, WVU yeah. Medicine. Is that correct? Yeah, and, I, and I'm and i an infectious disease specialist. That's what I do um, every day. Yes. Take care of kids with infections. Pediatric infectious diseases uh, director yeah. as well. So you have some bona fides here, as uh, they say. So... Uh, the the news that the legislature has uh, voted to approve this uh, relaxing of vaccination requirements, uh, your thoughts when you heard that? I'm very disappointed. I think it's a step in the wrong direction. Um, you know, I've been very proud. I've practiced in West Virginia for 26 years, and I'm very proud that we have the highest um, vaccination rates for school-age kids, and we do not have... Um, Outbreaks. We haven't had a case of measles in West Virginia in decades because of our strong laws. And it's not just protecting our kids. It's protecting um, the little babies who can't be vaccinated, the immunosuppressed, even the normal healthy kids who, are, who happen to just be a non-responder to vaccines. We're protecting pregnant women. We're protecting the elderly, those with cancer. Um, and, and I'm really proud of West Virginia. You know, um, we have led the nation. We're the model for um, good, strong, sound vaccine um, regulations. And, and we don't lead the list on very many other things in the, in the nation. But this is one I'm really proud of West Virginia for. We need to keep it the way it's been. 
I've interviewed several folks on this subject and talked with many others off the air in regard over the years because this is not new to this year. This is something that uh, they've been attempting to get some momentum to do over the right. last several years. And one of the uh, issues is, well, if everybody else is vaccinated for all the childhood vaccinations, you get measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, uh, and, and such. Uh, what's the big deal if a few people don't? If you're already vaccinated, you can't get those diseases, you're fine. What's your response to that? Well, so let's just talk about, um, you know, no vaccine is perfect. And what I mean by that is 100% of people don't respond to the vaccine. So the more people you have vaccinated, the more you're going to protect even the healthy kids who are non-responders. So with the first dose of the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine, probably 90 to 93 percent of kids get protection. But there's probably a 7 to 10 percent who don't. And we saw outbreaks in the late 80s, early 90s. So we added a second dose. And now we get way over 95, 98 percent protection. That's protecting those 2 to 5 percent who are healthy kids who don't respond but think of the kids in school who are undergoing cancer treatment. Their immunity is gone because of their chemotherapy. What about kids who, there are some kids who just cannot be vaccinated. They're immunocompromised. Maybe they've had a, they have a severe allergic reaction to the components of the vaccine. What about um, the, the person who has a newborn baby in their house and then they can't be vaccinated until they're 12 months. So there's a lot of susceptible people. And so if if everyone were to think, oh, I everyone else is vaccinated, I don't need to be, we're going to get a, a pretty substantial number of people unvaccinated, and then you're going to have outbreaks. That's what we're seeing in Florida right now. Um, we've seen in New York. Um, and, and it's often in an area where, there are a lot of people who choose not to vaccinate and you bring in a case of measles and then um, they're all going to get measles. You're, it, it, this is the most contagious infectious disease that we know of. It's kind of the, the standard model of how infection is infectious is something compared to measles. you know, over 90% chance if you are exposed to somebody with measles and you haven't had it, you're going to get it. Um, how do and these... it's not a benign illness. How, I want to. We can get into the reactions to the illness in, yeah. a, in a moment, but if you could tell me, uh, how do these diseases spread? Are they easily contagious, or is it actually quite yeah. difficult to catch it from somebody else? Well, this one's the most contagious. It's highly contagious. It's airborne. Which one are we talking about, Doctor Mamet? Measles. Measles. Yeah, measles. It's airborne. It's respiratory secretion. So. You just put a kid in a classroom for a little bit of time. You ride an elevator with someone, um, maybe going to their appointment, and they're coughing or they're they're contagious. You're in daycare. You're in church, and and you're you're contagious for four days before you have a rash. Um, so you may the kid may feel a little ill, and might have a little fever, and they think, oh, he's fine, and you go out four days before you're, you have a rash that you could really diagnose measles. And so people are, you could get it in the grocery store, standing in the line in the grocery store. Highly, highly contagious. More contagious than COVID, more contagious than chicken pox or flu, highly contagious. Some people claim uh, they need a religious exemption for uh, getting uh, this vaccine. I, I'm not going to get into that right now because I think that's a yeah. relatively small percentage who really truly believe that. Uh, there are others, though, who are concerned about adverse reactions for their children, children being harmed, maybe even dying from the vaccine. There are funds that are set up to compensate those who have been harmed by these vaccines. My question to you is twofold. One, how frequent are these reactions that result in actually being harmed? And two, is there any research that has been done in the 50 years we've been doing vaccinations or so that would lead to some form of screening that would tell us before a person gets the vaccine whether they are the type of person that would get a bad reaction to a vaccine? Yeah, that the last question I can I think people have looked at this and it's it's I don't think there's any good way to figure that out unfortunately. Um 
uh, who so i'll i'll answer your first question though um the, you know people get redness and get a local reaction to vaccines and we know with the mmr measles mumps rubella measles doesn't come separately there's actually two vaccines it's either mmr measles mumps and rubella or you add varicella which is chicken pox to that so it's known as mmrv um, but we know that people get a get sore at their arm or their leg. The toddler probably gets it in the leg. Um, children can get fever with the with the MMR, and it's more likely probably with the first dose that they get when they're a toddler. And it's probably somewhere around five to ten, maybe fifteen percent will get a get a fever. And the fever is usually about a week after the vaccine, which always tells me that they're responding in a, in a good way to the, the immune, they're getting, hopefully getting immunity. Um, some children can have a febrile seizure. This is an age when children get a high fever and they will have a febrile seizure. They're, they're benign. They're not, I mean, it's scary for any parent, anyone to have a seizure. And we know that the MMRV is more likely to give fever to a toddler. So we don't give the the one, the four combo to the toddler because they're twice as likely to have a, a febrile seizure. So we give the MMR and then we give the varicella separately. There's rash. About 5% will get a transient rash. They're not contagious. Um, and then, um, and then there is a transient association, um, about one in four or five thousand kids to get a, a lowered platelet count transiently and then resolve. None of these have been associated with any proven deaths of children. Um, and when you when you so that that all may sound scary, but the kids respond and these are these are transient and then they um, they're fine. Now the one. Severe reaction, which is extremely rare, is to have anaphylaxis, a, a severe, that's what you're talking about. Can we figure out who's going to have the severe allergic reaction? And um, and those are about, I think the, the data says it's about one in a million kids. So pretty rare. Um, so that's what I can say. Now, if you compare to the what you would have if you got measles, you know, everything is a risk-benefit in life. Um, and if you compare to measles, if you're ready, when, when you're ready to talk about what measles is, then we can go into the risks, and, and there's real risk of death with measles and a whole lot of other things. Well, maybe you could touch upon that quickly before we get to uh, Bill and John's questions, Dr. Moffitt. Yeah, so, so I always learned that rubella is called German measles, is kind of three-day measles, and then measles rubiola which is what we're talking about the m of the measles is um is a nine day so kids are sick for a week and a half to two weeks everybody there's not a benign milder case of measles so imagine your kid getting measles they're going to be you're going to be out for two weeks and um and you get you get red eyes conjunctivitis you get severe coughing congestion lots of nasal secretions kids get croup or bronchitis or pneumonia, they get ear infections, they get diarrhea, can get dehydrated, and then they get a classic rash, but the rash doesn't show up until day four. So you don't know a lot of times that it's measles until you get the rash. Um, but one in a thousand will get um, brain swelling, encephalitis, and the death for that is about um, one to three out of a thousand of those. So those are not preventable. Um, except by vaccination. So if you think about it, um, you know, children are going to die. We're going to see if you have enough cases of measles, we're going to have a, we're going to have encephalitis with the measles infection. And then a small percentage of those are going to die. And then within a year, there's another encephalitis that can occur um, that it probably leads to significant. Um, both Both of these lead to brain damage the children will survive. So maybe two out of a thousand will develop either the early or the later. Then there's an encephalitis that can occur at on average 10 years later with no warning, and that's fatal. So out of these three, three out of a thousand kids who get um, measles are going to either have 
brain damage or die. And um, three out of a thousand, and that's significant. Then, then there are the long-term effects of measles, which we know that children can be immunosuppressed for, for months to years afterwards and not respond well to other vaccines, get, get infections, get pneumonias, get, get diarrhea diseases, um, and be ill because their white cells are not functioning properly from the direct effect of having measles. Even though they survived measles, they did fine and they got better, but then they're immunosuppressed. So that's a, this is a significant burden. It's estimated that 25 to 50 percent of children with measles get hospitalized, um, high fever, diarrhea, not knowing why they're having fever for days and days with this rash. Um, so I think it's going to be more than 50 percent. Um, it, it's a it's a severe it's a very very severe disease and and a, around the world children die of measles in high proportions. I can't tell you today what the death rate would be because it, I mean encephalitis we know they'll the brain swelling and they'll die but um, you know if you if you develop a secondary bacterial pneumonia on top of your viral measles and you get a staph pneumonia you're probably not going to die in the United States. You're going to get in the hospital. You may be in the ICU for a couple of weeks. You'll see me or, you know, my colleagues. We treat you. You might get chest tubes. They may be on a ventilator. Um, but, but children probably in the United States are not going to die of pneumonia. Bill? But, um, so it's, a, it's anyway, I, I just can, cannot tell you how significant this disease is. And, and we don't have measles. So I've heard I've heard a quote from someone saying, "Well, I've walked around and looked in hospitals, and I don't see wards of children with these, you know, vaccine diseases. I don't see measles." Right? We don't <laughs> see measles because we vaccinate. I'm so glad we don't. Uh, good morning, Doctor. Your uh, uh, your statistics are sobering and very very insightful. Uh, my question is going to have political overtones because this yeah. has become a political issue. Uh, I'm old enough. I'm of the older, older generation. Yeah. I can remember firsthand the fear in my small rural hometown uh, in western Tennessee when someone had polio. It just yeah. sent shockwaves through the whole community and we were lo in lockdown for several, several days after that. Same thing with measles. Same same thing with uh, with other diseases. Uh, through my life, I I and others have depended upon organizations such as as CDC as being kind of the bulwark against these diseases. Yet, with COVID, this this institution has been under fire. It has become politicized. Do you see any way at all that the reputation or the role that CT, CDC played will reassume sometime in the in the future yeah i agree with you and i would hope that that will happen i think that we have to maybe move it a little to our our trust in our local and our public health people here we have you know we have such good um public health people in the state of west virginia they work really hard they 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 could probably use, we we could definitely everywhere could use more of them but that saddens me about the mistrust of the CDC. But, you know, if you if you talk to your own physician, um, if you talk to you're talking to me, I, I've, I've I've made West Virginia proud to be a West Virginia resident, made this my home. Um, I I um, want on an individual basis, every child to be healthy. I also want our community and our schools to not have outbreaks and then the state to be healthy. So, so I think that we have to start, um, we, we have to, we have to be, make this, have people understand personally why these public health issues are there. Yes, I want all children to be healthy, but I want Johnny, I want Susie to not, um, get sick and not develop encephalitis or pneumonia or whooping cough or polio or any any of those. Um, so I, I think it's a challenge. I think we have some work to do to restore the faith in in our public health um, and and understand just like we wear you wore your seatbelt. You know we wore our seatbelt in our car. We get our car inspected. 
Um, we follow those rules because we believe you put your child in a car seat. Do, does anyone know of a child who ever died in a in a in riding in the back of their station wagon? Well, you and I didn't because I'm I'm probably about your generation, maybe a little younger. But you know, we rode in the back of the station wagon. We happen to be the ones who survived. But today, you would never do that. And why? It's because the evidence in the public health, and we have trust in that. So. Vaccines, to me, are the same, that there's science and there's uh, logic behind these. And and they're really, I think it frustrates people, but they really aren't a choice. Um, it's part of what we do to keep ourselves healthy, our family healthy. Everyone wants their family to be healthy. Um, but um, but understanding how really significant these diseases can be, I, I, I think that's the that's the emphasis. Um, and we're glad we don't see them. John Gilstrap. Yeah, good morning, Dr. Moffitt. Um, I'm also of, of a previous generation, and the first uh, immunizations, the only immunizations I remember were for um, smallpox and polio. And my mom was right. of, if there was a disease that came into the house and measles was one of them, put my brother and I together in a room and let it rip. That was what it was with with um, uh, chicken pox and, and other diseases. Not the best technology at the time. <clears throat> My question with you is actually fairly self-serving here. Am I as immune or more immune, less immune by actually suffering through the disease as, as a child and now I'm in my 60s? Am I as immune as if I had gotten the the uh, the shot, the, vac the vaccine, yeah. and, and should I get one? Um, if you're, so the first answer is, um, immunity from natural disease many times is the same as getting vaccinated. Many times it's not as good. Um, but with measles, you can't tell if somebody's had natural measles. Like I had natural measles too. I'm, I'm, I'm of the, before the vaccine was, was, um, in the, yeah. So, and you too. And, but, um, so you can't tell. And there's no, superiority to having had the natural disease over being vaccinated. And actually, chickenpox is a good example that um, we're at risk for shingles by having had natural chickenpox. And now there are shingles vaccines for adults um, to boost your immunity so that you don't get shingles. Because if you've ever known anyone with shingles, it's painful, it, it can be chronic and not go away, and then you're contagious with the with the chickenpox virus. So, um, they, but most times vaccines are kind of equal to, to natural immunity. One isn't better than the other. We haven't solved the nut or the, the, we haven't solved the dilemma of how do we understand our immune system enough to have a perfect vaccine? You know what would be my fantasy? One flu vaccine for life and you're immune for life. You're never going to get flu. Yeah. That hasn't happened yet. We haven't been able to figure out what it is that we need because that flu virus just keeps changing and so we get a, a, a booster every year to try and keep us healthy and some people do get flu after the vaccine but usually it's milder than when you're wide open and you haven't had flu for a while do any so of these it, immunology is challenging <laughs> Do any of these diseases ultimately die? For example, do we still have smallpox in the United States? Do we still have polio no, in the United States? Small, sm oh, smallpox been, has been eradicated. Polio is, is um, we haven't had a case of wild type polio in the United States. And there's a few countries, you know, Rotary and there's the world polio um, measure to try and eradicate worldwide polio. We're close. There's there's three three different serotypes of polio and two have been eradicated. Um, it's in the war torn areas of Africa and Afghanistan, I think, where there still is some polio. Um, we, we you may have heard in the news that there was some polio in New York State, and um, those were um, people who um, had traveled and were exposed or. I, I haven't seen a full report on that, but that was not wild type polio. So the reason, let me just tell you a little bit about polio. We stopped giving the oral um, live weakened or attenuated oral polio vaccine in the 90s 
because um, a few people every year who were immunosuppressed could get polio from the weakened strain in the polio virus. So we started giving polio as a shot. And we haven't seen polio in the United States. And we continue to vaccinate children because we're, we, until it's eradicated worldwide, a case could be brought in and then we could have outbreaks. Um, so those cases have been um, associated with people being other places getting, getting exposed to the vaccine strain of the polio virus given in other countries. Um, not while we have not had wild type polio in the U.S. Dr. Moffat, has your input or any of the other infectious diseases experts uh, at uh, the university been uh, requested by the legislature while considering this legislation? No, I haven't. Now, we've called, we've emailed, um, we, um, you know, we have um, gotten all our advocates. I know the pediatricians have, have been burning the phone lines. Um, to first to the House of Delegates and then now to the senators to say, please oppose this bill. But no, they haven't to ask us to come and give any facts. Um, disappointing, because I think, um, you know, the headline in the Dominion Post yesterday, um, Tom Bloom is the, um, I think, I, anyway, was opposed. This is, um, here, this is what it says, Bloom. Mon County Commissioner Tom Bloom, um, 5105, a threat to West Virginia public schools. So listen to our school experts, listen to our, um, our physicians, our infectious disease experts um, about what's right for children. Dr. Moffitt, thank you so much for your time this morning. Greatly appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Have a great morning. You too. I want to thank Teresa McCabe from WVU Medicine for setting that up for us and doing all the groundwork for finding the right person to fit the interview. Great job, Teresa. Great job by Dr. Moffitt. Very informative there.